Okay, hi everybody. Uh, so this is the uh, first of uh, parts of the lecture three uh, in this uh, series of uh, video presentations. We'll be uh, covering <clears throat> sort of the next generation of economists uh, after Adam Smith. Uh, so this is a time period, the early years of the 19th century. Uh, all of the authors in this lecture series were well acquainted with Smith's work and certainly had read The Wealth of Nations as well as, as, as his other works uh, and were, real, were building upon uh, that tradition in different directions as we'll see. Uh, the first part here uh, of this uh, series of video presentations will be on uh, Thomas Robert Malthus. Uh, Malthus was a uh, was the, the first professor of economics, political economy. Um, he was uh, early in his career a, a preacher, uh, uh, so a religious religious man. Uh, he um, really innovated in a number of areas in economics. Uh, he had a long-standing relationship with David Ricardo, who will be in the second of these video lectures, and probably the third. Uh, and the two of them really spent their lifetime sort of bouncing economic ideas off each other and more frequently than not disagreeing with each other. Uh, unlike Ricardo, they, they, Malthus and Ricardo sort of took really different approaches to economics. Uh, whereas we'll see in the next time, David Ricardo was very specific. He focused very tightly and narrowly on specific economic questions and delved into them rather thoroughly. Uh, so very deep but also very narrow. Uh, Robert Malthus is in, in some ways the opposite, uh, really didn't delve into a lot of issues very deeply, uh, but, but delved into quite a few issues. And I, I take the time to mention this because it's really only one of Malthus's ideas that ever gets any, any play in, in these types of courses, and that's his theory of population, which by far is his most developed economic theory. Um, but, you know, some other areas, uh, Malthus had some, some pretty interesting ideas about money and inflation. Uh, he also had some pretty interesting ideas about business cycles, and those are things that wouldn't be developed uh, much more fully until the 20th century, so a long time uh, later. But, but he, you know, he was, he was a broader thinker than, than maybe we, we give him credit for today. Nonetheless, despite all that, we're going to uh, focus today on his uh, theory of population growth and in particular what it teaches us about designing economic hypotheses and conducting economic research. Okay, so there we go. As I mentioned a moment ago, um, you know, Malthus was well, well read in Smith and in many ways he's, he's building upon Smith. Uh, as we'll see, and certainly his theory of population builds upon Smith, albeit takes, oh, it takes it in a different direction, right? So we should see Malthus as an outgrowth of, of Smith. Uh, and we'll remember, if you see, saw the video lecture two, the, all four parts there on Adam Smith, uh, we talked about, you know, growth in Adam Smith. So you get, um, in Smith, you get some kind of expansion of the market, which allows for an increasing, um, division of labor and increasing division of labor brings about increased productivity and increased productivity and then turn turn brings about an increase in the material standard of living. So uh, that's how economic growth occurs. Now of course, you know, how do you get expansion of the market? Well, one way is is, is you have more people, right? So so population growth is is very much a um, foundational aspect of of Smith's growth theory, growth theory. But where Smith is very optimistic, i.e. more people, more economic growth, Malthus takes that idea in a different direction. So this is a picture of Malthus over there. So you can see he's a, he's a generation or so after Smith, right? So he would have been 10 years old when Wealth of Nations was published. So, uh, you know, they didn't hang out together, go to the bar or anything like that. <laughs> this is the next generation, okay? 
uh, you know, he didn't think he didn't didn't believe it. He didn't didn't think that increase in population would bring about increases in the material standard of living of of the average folks, right? So um, he thought instead that the, you know, no matter what, you get more people. Uh, wages and therefore the standard of living will always gravitate towards subsistence and what we mean by subsistence is just enough to keep going right it's a little trickier than that right but let's let's start with there and we can maybe discuss a little more later on so the center point of Malthus's argument so wh where you know what allows him to deviate so remember Smith more people more wealth <laughs> right better standard of living Malthus more people probably not <laughs> increasing standard of living okay so you know where where do they go different right well Malthus starts with this central idea that, that he says okay well population left unchecked right we'll, we'll talk about checks on population in a little while but left unchecked will grow geometrically that is say 2 to 4 4 to 8 8 to 16 16 to 32 and so on and so forth uh, in other words, like the, the green curve here on, on the PowerPoint slide below. But food supply will grow arithmetically. That is to say 1 to 2, 3 to 4, sorry, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 5, and so on. And as a consequence of this, there would always be a pressure on the food supply. Right? There will always be uh, as many or more people than can be fed. Right? And uh, this this leads him down this road, okay? Now, Malthus um, based his studies, at least in subsequent editions of his, of his theory, right? So not so much in the first edition, but in the second through the fourth or fifth edition, I forget. Anyway, Malthus used data from, you know, the UK census uh, as well as US census data. Right, so uh, side note here, the U.S. Census is required by the United States Constitution. Okay, so it is a data requirement formally written into the most foundational component of U.S. law. Okay, um, data requirements are often written into law to this day. Uh, and the reason why it is going to be a theme of this presentation is that data allows us to have shared understandings about social events that we all share. Okay, now I know I'm going sort of aside from here, but it's, wor it's worthwhile <laughs> to go aside here for a little while, right? Okay, so let's think about some super foundational data that that you know maybe. You never even thought of it this way before, but you know, what's a kilogram? Who defines it? Okay, for the for Americans out there, what's a pound? Okay, who defines it? Do you define what a pound is? What if you could define what a pound is? Would you make it different? Okay. Shared definitions about data are what are foundational to exchange. Uh, they're foundational to any kind of shared understanding of anything, right? And so when we talk about data and we talk about its place in society, it is foundational. It is critical uh, that we have sol solid and sound data that we can all rely on to come to shared conclusions about problems. Okay. And so as sort of economists, or in some respects, it <laughs> sounds very dramatic to say so, but sort of guardians of the data, right? We should understand that attacks on data are hazardous. And we should also understand that faulty data is equally hazardous. Okay. All right. So back to Malthus. So Malthus, you know, used some of the limited data that was available at the time and in doing so he was he was either the first right or one of the very first people to use data to support an economic argument you know smith for all his greatness uh 
doesn't have a lick of economic. Well, that's not true. He has he has some numbers, <laughs> some data, but uh, it's not really in support of his arguments or anything like that. Uh, and certainly, you know, going back earlier than that, um, there's no the the idea that we would utilize data to develop and support an economic argument was pretty novel back in back in those days. And so in Malthus, we see the sort of beginnings of economics as an empirical science, which in 2020, it absolutely is. Uh, it absolutely is. Um, uh, personally, myself, I, so talking about economics education for a moment, if you'll allow me to soapbox for a minute, it, you know, I, I would say that, that, that any economist who, who doesn't have a basic understanding of econometrics is, 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 is is really in a difficult spot for themselves because uh, you need to understand empirics to be an economist and I also suggest that this class is is quite important because this class should t tell us how to structure hypotheses and how to construct ideas and start thinking about how we develop the kind of tests that we would that we would actually do in, in a, say in an econometric model but there we have it okay so today there's no question economics is an empirical science So, going back to this idea again, right? So this is the center point of the hypothesis, and we took a few side roads there. So Malthus didn't deny, right, that technology or knowledge, you know, could could improve the standard of living in the short run, right? So there could be something that, you know, makes farming a lot more productive, or you know, new trade routes that, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, allowed new goods and services to come into uh, the marketplace and thus also improve people's standard of living um, but he, you know he said that over time uh, those gains would literally be eaten away so there's a bunch of kids eating here right <laughs> I, I googled bunch of kids eating for this picture right and that one came up uh, that, that any gains would be eaten away liter again literally by population growth so the story goes sort of like this it's a little small there, so so it's good to have your own. Remember, these PowerPoints are all available separately through the class. Um, the story goes sort of like something like this. Let's say that a hypothetical invention increases the food supply. Okay, so, you know, whatever, you know, crop rotation, diesel engines, you know, you, whatever you want, right? Well, that produces a real standard of living, um, a la Smith. Uh, and then sort of people are living good, right? They're living high in the hog, um, feeling good about their improved standard of living. And what do they do? They go and have more kids. And those kids can't produce food. And so the per person standard of living falls back to the most basic level, subsistence. Okay. Right. So it's, whenever there's extra, people just have more kids until there's no more extra. Right. That's sort of Malthus's story here. And this last idea, this idea that, that you know people just have more kids until there's so many people that wages are driven down to subsistence, uh, became known as the iron law of wages. <laughs> it's very dramatic, right? <laughs> Should tell us something about laws and economics, but that's not the law of demand. Yeah, yeah, we'll get to that one too eventually, <laughs> right? But laws and economics and the iron law of wages. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So when we talk about Ricardo, we're going to talk about iron law of wages. When we talk about Marx, we're going to talk about iron law of wages. Okay. So <clears throat> thus, you know, population growth would, would not lead to these improvements in the standard of living, like Smith said, because Malthus is saying, hey, you know, yeah, sure, you know, that sort of Smith story can, can go along, right? But you know what's going to happen when, when people start living good? Well, they're just going to make a bunch more kids, and then, you know, there's, things are going to go back to the way they were. <clears throat> okay, so now some of you are thinking like, well, wait a second here, you know, what if people just don't have as many kids, right? Like, couldn't they, like, not have kids? <laughs> so, you know, Malthus admits, right, that this could be a possibility, right? People could delay marriage or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, right? Your marriage, yeah. I Okay, remember, 1810 guys, 1810 guys and gals. <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> uh, so they might be willing to delay marriage to improve their standard of living, right? 
Um, but he also denied that this was very likely. So he sort of says, okay, yeah, this could happen, but probably not, right? Probably, you know, people will just have more kids, right? Especially people at the lower end of the income spectrum. So, you know, if you're thinking like, yeah, Malta sounds like a little bit of a snob too. Mm, yeah. <laughs> okay, right. All right. <clears throat> okay, so now some of you are thinking like, well, wait a second. Okay, if if people who are more wealthy are willing to forego marriage and have kids and, you know, you know, exercise what, what uh, Malta is called moral restraint, <laughs> okay, you know, what, what if then we created programs that the better off classes who were could practice moral restraint and you know were good upstanding citizens could you know help out the poor people who just couldn't couldn't control themselves or whatever okay well again same problem right so as soon as you give people more money right even if it's just redistributed uh, they're just gonna have more kids right they're gonna have more kids uh, and then the standard of living is just going to be brought back down in fact the whole thing's worse because now there's even more people who are just barely making it and starving Okay, <laughs> so awesome, right? Okay, so so there's no way, there's no way out then, right? There's no way out besides everybody's sort of going to live in misery because as soon as they're not living in misery, they have more kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> this is how economics came to be known as the dismal science, right? So maybe when, you know, for those of you who are studying economics, maybe, you know, you, you told your relatives or something you were studying economics and they said oh the dismal science okay or probably somebody said that to you whenever you said okay well this this is where it comes from right is it back in malthus's day and, and for some time after malthus right as we'll talk about with ricardo and and even with marx uh, so really the whole early years of the 19th the first half plus first two-thirds of the 19th century you know economics sort of predicted we're all doomed all the time and uh, so that's how we got to be known as a dismal science. And of course, as you might expect, you know, Malthus made a lot of friends with this argument. Um, in, in some ways, that's how he kind of ended up as the first economics professor because people kind of had to figure out what, what to do with Malthus. And, uh, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't really do his old job and couldn't really be a preacher or anything like this. And <laughs> so uh so you know if you if you're if you really want to win friends you know tell everybody we're doomed all the time no matter what we do uh people will really like you then <laughs> okay just kidding <clears throat> all right so at this juncture right we should we should understand that clearly there's a there's a serious problem with Malthus. but of course you've heard people made those make those arguments right people still make these Malthusian arguments all the time uh, if it's on the left, it's sort of this idea that, you know, there's so many kids and we're using up all Earth's resources and we're all going to die sometime soon, right? Uh, and if it's on the right, it tends to be things like, well, you know, if you just, those poor people, they're just, they just make bad choices. And if you just give them something, you're just allowing them to make more bad choices, right? So those are both Malthusian principles. And, you know, they come from sort of today, right, from all over the political, American political spectrum. But of course, there are serious problems with Malthus's argument, right? Uh, just, just, just the most casual empiricism today would, would tell us there's serious problems. So if we look at like world standard of living in 2020 versus say like 1980 or 1970 or 1960, a smaller share of the world's population lives in poverty today than did 60 years ago. Yeah, that's something that 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 people often don't pay attention to, right? So, so there there are places in the world that are economically worse off today than they were 40 years ago. Uh, that's true. But those places are the exceptions to the general rule uh, that, in fact, there are fewer people living in poverty today as a share of the world's population than there were, you know, 60 years ago. And a significantly smaller share than when compared to Malthus's time. So, you know, just, just the the most basic data would tell us, wow, Malthus is writing, sh shoot, you know, 200 plus years ago. Should have, it should have come true by now, right? But it hasn't. Okay. So here's another problem with Malthus. He set his theory up into a way that it cannot be shown to be incorrect. 
right? So let, let's throw that data at Malthus that we just talked about, right? We say, well, people are, you know, they're, they're not dying of starvation in mass in the world of 2020. In fact, less than people are dying of starvation as a share of the whole population than were in 1810. Okay. Well, Malthus would say, well, just wait, right? Okay, so in, in the Malthusian thing, right, population goes up, people starve, hey, told you so. Population does not go up, well, well, that's because people use birth control, right? First of all, side note, right, birth control in Malthus equals bad, right? <laughs> Why? Because, well, 1810, all right? Okay. Um, so, okay, well, I wasn't... I, you know, so if I'm Malthus, right? Well, I wasn't wrong because, yeah, you've showed me that less people are starving, but, you know, that's because they're using birth control, which is is also bad, right? Starving equals bad. Using birth control also equals bad, right? Or, failing that, well, yeah, they, they, there may have been some spurts in technology, right, that did increase food supply and, you know, made things better off and everything else. But you just wait. You just wait. Uh, those those poor people are going to have a whole bunch more kids any, any second now. And, um, you know, then then we'll we'll be right we'll be right there right we'll be back <laughs> okay all right now we're, I'm laughing about this right uh, and and maybe you are too uh, but 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 people still do this stuff all the time people, even economists still do this 2008 when the you know first recession the 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 financial crisis recession hit you know the federal government did this like three quarters of a trillion dollar stimulus plan. And there were a bunch of economists like, well, inflation's gonna happen any second, you know, inflation's gonna happen. You just you just wait. Inflation 2010 went by, no inflation, 2011 went by, 2000 inflation, 2012 went by with no inflation. And it's there was well, there was less and less of them, but there was still a group of economists going, Oh, you just wait, you just wait, there's gonna be inflation at any moment now, right? Then you know, in 2016, we're at the, what seems to be the peak of a business cycle. We've eliminated from the Great Recession, and the, you know, the Trump administration starts spending a whole bunch of money in the 2017 budget. It's more stimulus on top of a booming economy, and economists are, oh, inflation any second. Now, you just wait, just wait, inflation, it's going to happen. 2017 went by, 2018 went by, 2019 went by, no inflation. 2020, we get hit with this pandemic, and then now the government dumps even crazy more amounts of money into the economy and spending. So the Fed dumps a bunch of money in terms of lower interest rate, and the federal government dumps a bunch of money in terms of stimulus spending. And still, no inflation, right? But boy, there's still a handful of economists out there like, oh, you just wait, any day, any day now, inflation. <laughs> um, you know, so we still do that stuff. Right, we still do that stuff. We still say as economists things like, "Oh, but in the long run, mm, in the long run." Okay, well, just remember that. So when you you, you know you mock Malthus about his sort of non-falsifiable predictions here about population and misery, um, you know, glass houses and throwing rocks and all that. <clears throat> okay, so we learned some things from Malthus. Right, we learned. I mean, it's, it's clearly wrong, right? The population doctrine is clearly wrong. Malthus teaches us a couple things. First of all, he teaches us about the importance of falsification in moving ideas forward. We have to have some kind of test in our hypotheses by which we can say, this was right or this was wrong. And allowing for both those possibilities allows us to move forward with ideas to discard what isn't working or doesn't appear to predict or doesn't seem to appear to explain our reality and replace it with something that we think is a little bit better, right? And a failure to do that, a failure to sort of build falsability, falsifiability into your hypotheses um, really creates a intellectual dead end. <clears throat> the second thing, oh, the little picture here is scientific method, right? The second thing that Malthus, Malthus teaches us is that bad data yields bad results. So Malthus' hypotheses were built upon limited data sets, and quite poor ones at that. Uh, if we just apply Malthus' reasoning to a better data set, which we obviously have nowadays, we find that population increases much less quickly than Malthus thought. So Malthus thought the population would grow at like 3% per annual. Turns out that, that 
population grows at well these days at less than half of that right and and those of you who understand that so understand geometric functions know that 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 means the predictions are way 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 off okay second we know that you know people will forego more kids in order to prove their standard of living right that's that that's quite clear with 200 years later second or sorry thirdly we we know that gains in food supply productivity you know can outpace population growth for long periods of time i mean we're going 200 years and running right now <laughs> from all this right so you know when you when when you hear people talk about the well but in the long run so okay well well all right let's let's be clear what is the long run when do you think the long run becomes relevant to the discussion is it five years from now okay is it 10 years from now okay is it 50 years from now mm. is it 100 years from now mm. is it 500 years from now? <laughs> right okay so it isn't to say that long run ideas are not useful um, but we need to put some kind of time limit on what what we mean by the long run because otherwise we lose possibility right if we say that a thing can happen in the long run and the long run is sometime in the indefinite future then it's no longer falsifiable right there's no way it can be wrong okay so you know what what can we do <laughs> how can we make better theory well <clears throat> as I mentioned it's important to build falsifiability into our hypotheses it's important to explain what time frame over which our uh, hypotheses should be relevant should we observe if our hypothesis is true we should observe this in say six months or ten months or two years or whatever okay and it's important to develop predictions that are in line with the quality of our data so if we know that our data is rather poor then we should also be making relatively weak predictions uh, making strong predictions requires extremely strong data um, and extremely strong signaling from that data uh, and so this, it also isn't to say that we shouldn't do analysis when we have weak data right and oftentimes you it's all you have you have weak data or sometimes even like non-existent uh, uh, numerical data right you, you might even just have antidotal data but yet from that you have to do some work right because you're trying to solve problems but that your solutions to those problems should be in line with the quality of data that you have right your predictions should be in line with the quality of data that you have so if your data is poor it doesn't mean you shouldn't do the work it just means you got to really qualify your results um, okay so last slide just pulling Malthus. So we really threw Malthus under the bus, right? You know, all right, you, you screwed it all up, right? Okay, well, let's, let's pull them back a little bit. So a couple things that we get out of Malthus. So this is, in some ways, Malthus did, did point the way forward for economics. Uh, and, and the first one of those is that economics, you know, when done right, right? And that, that's my most controversial statement to the term. <laughs> for sure, you can find economists out there who disagree with that. But... Uh, for me, at any rate, economics, when done well, is an empirical science. Uh, we use data, right? We use data. And um, you know, Malthus was, was kind of the first to do that. The second thing that Malthus teaches us, or shows us that, he shows us the way forward, is to think systematically, right? That is, you know, if this happens, then that will cause this to happen, which will likely mean that this other thing will happen, and so on. To think about causes, end effects okay um, that's another thing that that we often don't do or casual I should say uh, amateur economists do not do well so say things like well you know if you if you raise the minimum wage then it's going to result in unemployment in fact you know that sort of sits in most EC 103 textbooks that's a perfect example of non-systemic thinking okay right if I if I raise the minimum wage let's say that you know so then some people will say well that just will raise prices okay okay well let's just roll on that for a second so if we raise a minimum wage across the board let's say that that creates a uniform 
increase in the cost of doing business, which causes businesses to improve, in, increase prices in those markets that are impacted by the minimum wage, right? So that a certain type of prices rise, right? So prices that are based upon low wage income rise. And so there's some inflation, right? Well, does that, is there unemployment then? Well, if the real wage remains the same, I mean, it's not going to, it's, it's going to, it's going to rise a little bit, but let's just say the real wage remains the same, then it's no unemployment. Okay, so um, there's a billion examples of those uh, sort of armchair economists and non-systemic thinking. And uh, Malthus is really, you know, really kind of, he, he's trying to think systematically, like he's trying to think, okay, well, if that happens, then that that's also probably going to happen. In other words, the reasoning that he applies to the first stage of his analysis he applies it again to the second stage and the third stage and so on. Uh, and again, good economics, economics done well, should think systematically, right? And if it's unable to think systematically, again, its prediction should be qualified uh, to a large extent. All right, so that's my, you know, two cents on Malthus. Uh, again, Malthus had a lot more to offer, but this, you know, his population stuff, this is really what he spent his time on and he developed. Uh, and his back and forth with Ricardo, they sort of had a lot of other ideas that were sort of half developed. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you're interested in like money and the nature of money, you know, Malthus is worth reading on that. Um, business cycle theory, as I mentioned earlier, Malthus is worthwhile reading on that. Um, well, I'll be honest, he's not my favorite character in this sort of history of economic thought. I like Smith a lot more. I'd rather, you know, if you'd be like, who you want to hang out with, Smith or Malthus? I'm like, I, I want to hang out with Smith. <laughs> Um, but but definitely a worthwhile thinker and um, you know teaches us a lot about about doing economics. Uh, we'll leave it there uh, and we'll see you again soon next time. Take care everybody.